everyone, I'm Shelley and I'm an academic physicist and uh, there are three things that I want to discuss in this talk with you today. The first one is, from my perspective, what's going on in science right now and my very personal feelings about why it's incredibly important that we get on with this disruption business. And um, there are two perspectives <coughs> on this. Um, the second thing I want to talk about is ways that we can begin nucleating disruption from within the scientific establishment as it currently stands. And the third thing I want to talk about is a bit more controversial, but it's going to be about um, seeding a vision for the future. You know, what would science in the 21st century actually look like? And are there seeds of this, view this viewpoint or this, this way of doing things that are actually available right now? And um, that's probably going to be a little bit controversial. I definitely don't expect people to agree with everything I say. That's fine. But we've got half an hour at the end in which you are absolutely free to grill me with whatever you want. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to start with why I think disruption desperately needs to happen. Now, from my perspective, the first and the most important reason is that right now, science is not working. Now that is a relatively controversial thing to say because the headlines are full of things like graphene, which sound very exciting, and um, a bunch of biotechnology stuff, which frankly, I'm gonna hold my hands up and say I don't know anything about it. Maybe it's true there, but I can tell you in physics, it's absolutely not. And if you look back in 2005, the journal Science published a list of 125 really important unanswered research questions. And there were about 25 of those relating directly to physics. And we're now in 2016, which is 11 years on, and I can tell you there has been zero progress on those essential, fundamental, really important questions. If you look at, I would say, probably the biggest question facing the field, which is, uh, or at least the question as we currently understand it, which is, how to reconcile relativity with quantum mechanics. Now that question has been around for 100 years. I mean, relativity was developed, I would say first 1916, later 1921. Quantum mechanics developed around that time as well. Literally, we are 100 years on, and we do not have an answer to that question. And I would say, more importantly, it's not just that we don't have an answer to that question, we don't even know if that is the right question to be answered. <coughs> Because when we're saying we have these two theories, relativity, which describes the way that objects behave at very large length scales, macroscopic length and time scales, and we have another theory that describes how objects behave at the quantum scale, which is the atomic or um, maybe nanometer scale. You know, we're saying we have these two theories and we need to, need to reconcile them. Maybe there is actually another theory that is um, couched in completely different terms which in a special case may lead to one or the other. You know, the, the question as it's posed may, may not even be right. And perhaps even bigger for me is the fact that right now there are 10 times, well the best estimate is that there are 10 times as many scientists practicing in science right now as there have been in the whole of recorded history. So right now statistically we should have 10 Einsteins in the field. We should have 10 Marie Curies. We should have 10 Tesla's. Where are these people and what are they doing? Because I can tell you, we haven't seen another relativity for 100 years. We should have 10 theories of relativity. Or the 10 theories that go beyond relativity. I mean, where are they, right? So the question is, these people are here, but what are they doing? Now, um, obviously the, the first possibility is that it might be that none of them are actually in science. And I would wonder if Einstein today, or Tesla today, would look at the scientific establishment and say that they wanted to work in it. I mean, possibly not. But just assuming that those people have got the guts, they're going to stick it out, and they're going to say, right, I'm, I'm, I'm going to do it, I'm going to be a scientist, what are they going to post? Well, it looks kind of something like this. Yeah. So if you're a practicing scientist, and I'm pretty sure the researchers in the room are going to relate to at least some of this, um, I look at my time and I say, okay, I'm spending about half of it writing grants and doing administration. Brilliant. Uh, I mean, that's, that's what I dreamt of as a kid, you know. I, I used to read encyclopedias and 
I look at images of stars in the sky and think, you know, someday I can do that. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this is what we all want to do. 20% um, undergrad teaching, probably about 20% managing my research group. And when I say management, I mean things like, come on guys, the server's down, have you backed up your data? Um, I noticed they haven't put scale bar images this image. Stuff like that, right? Maybe 10% travel, I like, come on, 0% no fun. It is 0% no fun, <laughs> right? So um, that kind of leads us to the second problem, which is basically science is not working, but also scientists don't like doing it very much. And for me, those two things are intimately related. If scientists don't enjoy doing their job very much, something is wrong, absolutely wrong. And for me, it may not be the full core of what's going on, but definitely an important aspect underlying this is the focus in scientific culture right now on metrics. Now, of course, I'm never going to argue that we shouldn't check what people are doing with their time. Of course, money goes into the system, and it is completely reasonable to keep some kind of eye on what we're all doing with that money. But for me, when the focus is on the metrics and not on the conditions that are needed to generate the, the next relativity, the next quantum mechanics, what you get is a system that is constructed around <coughs> ticking the boxes that are required for the metrics. And for me, this is a bit like planting cabbages in the desert, right? Maybe, maybe some guy someday, in a bit of shade and a lot of water, manages to grow one cabbage in the desert. And uh, people come along, they're like, great, great, we've got cabbage out in the desert, brilliant, brilliant. Um, okay, we're gonna give you lots of money, buy lots of cabbage seeds and make more cabbages. And um, we're gonna set you a quota next year. We want 10 cabbages out of this field. And we, we want an accounting for every single cabbage seed you plant, right? And nobody actually says, well, <coughs> you know, cabbages don't grow very well in the desert. Cabbages grow pretty well in Norfolk, where it is cold, wet, and muddy, which is what cabbage is like. And um, for me, this is a lot like the conditions that are needed. This is, this is a lot like what, what we actually need to genuinely make science work, to really make it fun. Okay, because, I mean, scientists right now are in a system which treats them as though they're working in a big accounting firm, right? You don't get good cabbages by planting them in the desert. You've got to plant them in a place where the conditions are ripe for them to grow and to meet their fullest potential. I'm working in a field where the only way to make progress is to have incredibly bright, radical, revolutionary ideas, and you do not get ideas when you are spending your life doing administration management and box ticking. Okay? So the big question for me is how can we how can we turn that around? And what happens when we try? So starting in my own small corner of the world, I um, I say, well, um, where, where can I begin? What's the most exciting place to start? So what I've done is uh, I've noticed that undergraduate teaching is a place where metrics are particularly prevalent, where there's a lot of pressure to uh, conform to the student satisfaction survey. Um, I, get, I get every term, the students are given a long list of surveys and boxes they've got to fill out. And a lot of courses are aimed at trying to kind of squeeze into students' expectations. And I thought, right, okay, what's gonna happen if I throw away the metrics and I just say, what's actually fun? What, what do I find fun? What do I find engaging? So um, what I've done is started off by scrapping the idea of a lecture and beginning with what I feel is going to be more interesting to me, which is to start off by having some discussion of the content and then the rest of it being a series of questions where the focus within the course is as much on the questions as it, as it is on the predefined answers. And at the end of every lecture, we also have a discussion about what isn't known. So the focus is also on what isn't covered, what isn't known, what isn't addressed by the current theories. So when the students leave, they leave with a perspective of what do we not know? What is it like to construct a good research question? And that they've also had the opportunity to look at the material from a lot of different angles. Um, I also lecture in a dinosaur suit occasionally. <laughs> uh, sometimes it's in a, an LED hat, and it depends what I feel like on the day. But it'll be something that's not expected something where they walk into the room and they just do not know what is going to happen next. And it is that 
atmosphere of we don't know what's going to happen next. Questions. Let's come up with our own ideas. What do we not know? We could be the people to fill these gaps in the scientific knowledge. And not a single mention of metric. And not surprisingly, it turned out to be the highest rated course of the year. So that's one example. Um, another example is uh, coming from a slightly broader perspective, which is to do with how research is funded. Now, um, those, any, those of you who have any involvement in um, the, whole, uh, the whole funding game will know that there's a, a, lot of, uh, a lot of weight is placed on the possible outcomes and the possible impact of your research, despite the fact that the grant may last two to three years, when it takes maybe 20 years to bring technology from you know, the first germ of an idea to out there in the marketplace. So the time scale's a little bit short, you know? But, um, when it comes to grants being funded, a lot of funding bodies will put a lot of pressure on researchers to report frequently, to have a lot of milestones, to say exactly what will be accomplished in advance of each of these milestones, and then there'll be a check-up at the end to make sure that you did what you said you were going to do three years ago. And it kind of, it's a structure that actually eliminates the possibility of something creative happening within those three years that you had not previously thought of. And um, it's kind of, it, it's, it's almost counterproductive in the sense that, yeah, you've almost structurally eliminated the possibility of something new that is better than you'd previously thought of coming into being, being explored and being, being disseminated. So um, there was actually a study done in the USA which started to look into this issue a little bit. And what they did was they took uh, biomedical investigators were very good, a good track record, and they compared two funding schemes. Now, again, the purpose of this comparison was to try and distinguish what influence it had when you took one funding stream run by the National Institutes of Health, which was conventional, uh, there were a lot of metrics, you had to submit reports frequently, follow a well-structured plan of research, and um, submit your outputs at the end, all well-structured in advance, and there was a comparable scheme running for five years, the same length of time, uh, funding the same group of people, but this time funded by somebody called the Howard Hughes Institute, who ran things very differently. And what they said was, we want you to do the most creative work that you can do. We're not going to ask for a sort of pre-scheduled plan of work. We just want a page about your research intentions. And we want you to report every year telling us what you've been doing. Tell us about the exciting things that you're coming up with. And then at the end of those five years, it turned out that the investigators funded by the Howard Hughes Institute, who had the same academic achievement as the ones funded by the conventional group when they started, they produced twice as many high-impact papers in journals like Science and Nature, which we can say is, is arguably an indicator of what is genuinely disruptive in the field. So, to me, that is a quantitative, evidence-based example that when you take the focus off the metrics and you let bright people do what they do best without being sort of squeezed to death, the outcomes are twice as good as they would be otherwise. So, I mean, I hope I've given you both a personal example and a broader example of why it is better to focus on the conditions that give rise to good science than it is to focus on counting style mm -hmm. metrics that we're trying to use to define them at the end. So then for me, this is bringing up a lot of questions about how we might do science differently in the future. Now, I mean, the ancient Babylonians, I felt, had a really good point. Whenever they started a new enterprise, they would, uh, they would basically um, begin by consulting an astrologer to find the right time and the right energy to start off a new a new way of doing things. So for me, I don't actually believe that we are going to be able to see real destruction within science coming from within the current system, because that's been that's in existence already. There is a solid structure, and it's like sitting on an elephant. You're just not going to get that elephant to change direction very quickly anytime soon. You want to go somewhere new, you want to get there fast, you get off the elephant, you get into the Ferrari. So for me, what I'm interested in is finding environments that have the right kind of culture 
the right kind of energy that will then be taken forth into um, science as we know it. And um, I think the best place I've encountered so far is a little participatory festival in Denmark called Broadband, which I would say is Burning Man 2.0. And everything in this festival is done for the following reason, because it's fun. You want to do something great, it'll happen because it's fun. And what really stands out to me about this festival is that people work really hard all year long for no pay, and then they actually pay for a ticket at the end, because we've got, got to cover the cost of renting this quarry, and then you love it, absolutely love it. And um, this festival has given rise to a little community at the moment based in Stockholm, based in Copenhagen, where people are starting to do the kind of things that they do at this festival off their own back. They're starting to run workshops, they're, they've invented a new religion, they're um, <laughs> disrupting um, academic philosophy in quite a bit. <coughs> There's been quite a number of startups generated from this community. If you look at the number of startups from this community per head of population, it's ridiculous. Density is crazy. And I would say there is room for doing science differently from this approach as well. And the key aspects are the 10 principles of the, um, of the event. And probably what's most relevant to me is in science is radical inclusion. Let's get everyone contributing to science. The idea that the only people who can contribute to science are the ones who studied for seven or eight years, I think, is bunk. Uh, radical self-reliance. Come on in, take care of yourself, contribute wherever you can contribute. Communal effort. Let's do this as part of a community. But also, most importantly, participation, immediacy, and the creation of a culture where scientists are treated as whole, holistic human beings where our fundamental human needs for self-actualization, to have fun, to feel part of a community, to feel fulfilled, where those needs are met. Because creativity and creation is something that happens at the top of Maslow's pyramid of needs, you know? And I mean, I'm not gonna say this is automatically the answer for the future, but I am gonna say it's a spark that I found, and I would love to throw that sort of controversial out idea out here to the community. I'd love to hear what you think. And um, thanks very much for listening.